Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? In the 90s, the introduction of sub-notebooks yielded compact footprints and lighter weights, perfect for frequent travelers. But their small size also meant cramped keyboards. This time, let's take a look at a unique offering from IBM that tried to do it all. This is the ThinkPad 701C from 1995. Unfortunately, this particular unit is in rough shape. It was stored with its battery pack left installed, which over time leaked pretty severely. What makes this model unique is its so-called butterfly keyboard. It was IBM's attempt to provide a full-size typing experience in a sub-notebook-sized chassis. But before I could dig too deeply into the 701C experience, I needed to get that battery dealt with. In addition to leaking, it had swelled a bit, so holding the release latch while trying to gently pry it out didn't work. I'd have to disassemble the machine in order to extricate it. I started by ejecting the two PCMCIA cards already in the laptop. We'll take a closer look at them later. Then I used a Torx T6 screwdriver to remove a couple of fasteners from the bottom and used a magnet to fish them out. Then I flipped the machine over and opened the screen all the way so I could remove what IBM calls the keyboard shelf. It's basically just the piece of plastic between the keyboard and screen and lifts up from the right to unclip it. There are four screws across the front of the computer that help hold the keyboard to the bottom housing. The heads on them are incredibly small. They're Torx T1, which is a size I didn't even know existed. And unfortunately, the smallest bit I had on hand was a T3. So I had to order a new set of drivers and wait until the next day to continue. I got the first three screws out without a problem, but the fourth one, closest to the battery, was a different story. The leakage covered the screw, so I scraped off as much as I could, then scrubbed away the rest using an alcohol wipe. But that wasn't enough, as the residue had gotten inside the tiny head of the screw, keeping the driver from being able to turn it. While I figured out what to do next, I flipped the machine over and removed the rest of the screws from the bottom. There was one left securing the keyboard on the top in front of the right screen hinge. And then the keyboard just came free. The heavy battery leakage on the front corner was apparently so strong that it rendered the plastic especially brittle, and it just let go. I disconnected the three flat flex cables for the keyboard. Because it splits, there's one for the right side, another for the left side, and a third for the track point assembly. Thankfully, the motherboard seems to have been spared any damage from the battery. It was clean with no signs of the leakage reaching it at all. And with the keyboard removed, I also got my first good look at that battery. Ugh, what a mess. It seems to have leaked from multiple places. With the pressure from the casing gone, I could at least now slide it out. There's no saving this pack, so straight to recycling it went. The hard drive seems to have also been spared any damage, and I was able to slide it out as well. The metal piece held in by the tiny screws was actually supposed to be attached to the keyboard, but the plastic welds holding it on were also eaten by the battery electrolyte. I started cleaning out the bottom housing and found that the front corner was just crumbling with the slightest touch. I've never seen this sort of thing before. It's like the electrolyte chemically broke down the plastic. And it did a number on the ThinkPad's rubber coating, too. Even if the underlying plastic was still solid, the coating was all bubbled and peeling on the bottom. I cleaned the battery contacts on the motherboard and was glad to find there was no permanent damage here. Then I turned my attention to the underside of the keyboard, which had some residue on the front corner but it was just on the surface and didn't make its way into the mechanism, so it didn't take long to clean up. 
Now's a good time to look at that keyboard mechanism. The 701 does an interesting dance of moving the two keyboard halves when the screen is opened and closed. It's driven by the left hinge cover, which has this spiral shape molded into it. That pushes against a slider at the top of the keyboard to move the halves when the display is closed. The keyboard is spring-loaded, so when the screen is opened, it slides out on its own. There are a few tracks on the bottom of the board that show how the pieces move in order to fit inside the footprint of the laptop. Computers are often thought of as being marvels of electrical design, but this one had some clever mechanical engineering put into it too. With the ThinkPad cleaned up as best I could, it was time for reassembly. I got the keyboard cables reattached, then put that metal bar back into place. The screws through the bottom case would still be plenty to hold the keyboard in. Then I could flip the keyboard down and reinstall the screw by the display. The front left screw went back in as that goes to a bracket on the keyboard that didn't get damaged. Then I could carefully close the machine and turn it over to reinstall the rest of the fasteners. The keyboard shelf simply clipped back into place, and I gave the hard drive a quick cleaning before sliding it into its bay. I wiped down my work surface. A lot of dried electrolyte had flaked out of the machine, and then cleaned the outside of the 701C as best I could. Like with a lot of retro ThinkPads, though, its rubber coating had started to become sticky, so it tended to attract dust no matter how hard I tried. Even though it has a full-size keyboard, the 701C is still a sub-notebook at heart, with a limited selection of ports to match. On the left side is the power socket and switch, a parallel port with proprietary connector, built-in 14.4 modem, and audio jacks. The only other connector on the laptop is a docking port on the back, next to an infrared transceiver. That dock had been included with the machine and greatly expanded its connectivity by adding ports like video, serial, and PS2. It could pass through power as well, so one could leave it cabled up at their desk and simply snap the ThinkPad into it when needed. Another neat touch is that this middle panel unfolds to turn into a stand and raise the back of the laptop for more comfortable typing. Further expansion could be had through PCMCIA cards, and the two I pulled from the machine were all about communications. A 10 base T Ethernet card and a 288 modem. In an uncharacteristic bit of annoying design, they both used custom cables that weren't modular. Other cards often used an adapter dongle so you could plug in any cable that you had handy. And even worse, the connectors on the cards themselves were almost identical. So with all the cosmetic problems this machine faced, surely it would at least work correctly, right? Well, not so much. It powered on and went through a RAM test, but popped up several errors. Two of them made sense. They were related to the clock battery, which had likely gone flat over the last 25 plus years. I popped open the little cover on the bottom and disconnected it. I didn't have an identical spare, but did have some spare coin cells with solder tabs, and they were the same 3 volts as the original. I soldered the leads to the new battery and wrapped it in Kapton tape for insulation, and it fit perfectly in the machine. Another error was related to the track point, and was an even easier fix. I hadn't quite gotten its ribbon cable seated correctly. And while reconnecting it cleared the error, the battery-related ones remained, despite the new cell I installed. As did another error related to the RAM. I found that this machine had been upgraded with a 32 megabyte expansion module and suspected maybe it had gone bad, so I removed it. The 701C has 8 megabytes of RAM soldered to its motherboard, but sadly, the error persisted, referencing a specific address. That means one of the chips had gone bad, and would be an involved process to replace. Which I maybe would have been up for, if not for other problems with the computer. The worst of which was that I simply couldn't get it to boot from any drive. The hard drive was spinning and the system detected it, but wouldn't even try to find an OS. 
This 701C had also come with its external parallel port floppy drive, but the system never attempted to seek any boot floppy I inserted. I could get into the BIOS to confirm the settings, but after a moment or two, the whole system would simply freeze. If I tried to let it boot normally, all it would ever do is just show a blinking cursor. This motherboard is all sorts of messed up. And that sucks, especially since this is the highest end configuration that the 701 series came in. There were two main models in the lineup, the 701C and 701CS. The screens on both were 10.4 inches in diagonal and featured a resolution of 640x480, but the CS model had a lower quality dual scan panel, while the 701C was active matrix. This machine also has the faster 75 MHz Intel 486 DX4 processor, instead of the base model's 50 MHz chip. That 720 MB hard drive was the largest one offered, and the entire package sold for well over $4,000 US. The 701 series got a lot of attention when it debuted in early 1995. Besides the clever keyboard, officially called the TrackWrite, the machine's small size was a head-turner. But not all the attention was positive. PC Magazine found that the faster 75 MHz model barely performed any better than the cheaper 50 MHz version. IBM had also initially gone with nickel-cadmium chemistry for the battery, instead of the newer nickel-metal hydride technology. This caused runtime to be very underwhelming. At launch, a 701 could only manage about two hours on a charge. It was a machine with a compelling design and good intentions, but didn't quite hit the mark. Sales were decent, but users really wanted larger screens. And since that meant a bigger overall footprint, the butterfly keyboard was no longer necessary. The laptop had won awards for its design, but it was clearly a bit ahead of its time. So IBM discontinued it after about a year. These days, 701s are highly sought after by some in the retro computing community. Prices can reach astronomical numbers, and they're sure to go only higher. That's because the motherboard problems I encountered aren't unique to this machine. Apparently, RAM and other components are known to fail over time. Coupled with cosmetic issues, like batteries accidentally left installed, and the number of working, good condition units will continue to dwindle. This ThinkPad 701C was loaned to me to check out, and I'm disappointed I couldn't do more for it. At the same time, though, I'm glad I was finally able to at least experience one in person even if the first impression wasn't the best. I don't think these make for very practical retro machines. There are plenty of other models that are more well-rounded in their features and a lot more accessible price-wise, but I can understand how they could be compelling to have in one's collection. The 701 tried something completely new and novel, and while it may not have set future standards for notebook computing, it at least got people talking. Then, and now. If you like the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at ThisDoesNotComp. And as always, thanks for watching.